sufficient to preach it quickly in the narrative and then move on to different things. Remember that John, as he writes this gospel, he does so because God the Holy Spirit give, gave him the utterance, gave him the words, guided him perfectly. As we'll see later in years to come, that Jesus says that God the Holy Spirit will cause them to remember all things that he said. So it is not about the quality of the apostle, the academics of the evangelist, the ability or the cognitive function of the pastor. It is not about anything that man has to offer or can do in talent, in treasure, in time, but it is a, always and forever about what God has done. Only God can bring to mind the perfect recall of what Jesus has said. Only God the Holy Spirit can help you remember in that time that you need it the words of the Lord. Only God can keep you in the faith. There's nothing that you can do. Yes, there are disciplines that we are called to. There are levels of obedience that we are commanded to as believers. But even in that, as imperfect as it is, our only hope is in Christ. And only God the Holy Spirit keeps us therein. He is the guarantee of our hope. He is the seal of our inheritance. I know I transferred those, but they are equally the same. The Scripture shows us who God is, and it is the Holy Spirit through the Scripture that helps us to see Him. As John wrote this, he did so by the power of God, and he orchestrated this argument one after the other in order to build upon the reality of who Christ is. I say this often. I might have even said it last week. We cannot read the scripture as if it were a storybook, though it does contain stories. We cannot deal with John's gospel as if it's just a narrative of the life of Jesus because it's not just a narrative of the life of Jesus. As a matter of fact, there is so much more that Jesus said and did, as I said last week, that the scripture says that the world cannot contain. There are not enough volumes. There's not enough space in the world to contain the volumes that could be written about what Christ has said and done. Although some of you might see pastor's libraries and say, well, you're close. But God, the Holy Spirit, orchestrated the writing of John's gospel in the order that it's written for the sake of the argument of who Christ was. So that as Jesus passed by this blind man, we see in Acts, I mean in John 9, 1, the topic of conversation is much like it is with us. Especially some of us brothers who, you know, we might be doing anything. We may be cleaning a toilet or, or fixing a wall, but there's going to be an opportunity where somebody's going to mention something about the scriptures and we're going to be able to have a conversation about them. There's not a day that goes by that I don't get a question from somebody. Either from our fellowship or from my house or from on, the online communities or an email or my own head. I wonder what this is. And we all have a presupposition about many doctrinal things and theological things. And I will tell you that even as you've already seen, remember what I said in John 6, in the beginning of this, go back and listen to week 1. This is week 76. I challenge you all to recognize that God would really work against the status quo of your theology when you study the Gospel of John. And so John's Gospel, then starting in chapter 6, really begins to press against the grain of our cultural distinctives in relation to what? What we think Christianity is as a community, as a culture. And not necessarily us as in we, Grace Truth Church, but we as a culture, America, evangelicalism, Protestantism. 
what people think about Christianity as a whole, 90%, let's just make that number up. Uh, you know, good statistics are, be, are made up all the time uh, on the spot. Uh, and when we think about it, though, most of our culture believes in a false Christ. Most of the culture of Christendom in America doesn't even know the gospel. Ask them, what is the gospel? The best they can do is that Jesus died for my sins, which is not the gospel. It's an incomplete gospel, so it's not the gospel. How do you know you have eternal life? Well, most people say, because of what I did, because of what I believe. What do you believe? I believe I asked Jesus into my heart. That's not eternal life. It will not save you. And we have a problem in our country with mainline Christianity and even reform circles where they love to... to tout the idea of sola, 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 solo, soli. We're all in the solas. We love Christ and His faith and his, the, all these things. And Oh, we, we believe the gospel. No, that, the solas are not the gospel. Who Christ is and what He did and what He accomplished is the gospel. And for whom He accomplished it is the gospel. That is the root, the foundation that Paul talks about with the church of Corinth. Where he says that if we build on the foundation of Christ and the prophets with any other thing, it will not stand. We can build on the, on the foundation of Christ. We can build walls of morality. We can, build, we can build trusses of righteousness. We can do all sorts of benevolence. We can build a false uh, uh, intentions, good intentions, but false pretenses all over the place. But whatever is not the gospel of grace, Christ saving His people from their sins perfectly when He says it is finished, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are given to Christ Jesus. That is when and only when God the Holy Spirit calls His children to faith. When they hear that gospel, and it is the gospel we have been preaching here since the beginning, we see John's narrative as a systematic theological approach to the divine nature of Christ. He outlines it well in the first chapter. The light has come into the world. Jesus says that they love the darkness rather than light. Who? Nicodemus. The spiritual leaders of that day. A friend of mine who is born Jewish. He's an ethnic Jewish person raised in a Jewish home. God saved him many years ago from Judaism. And I just ask him because I have been getting in the last three or four months from without. You know, you sound anti-Semitic. You, you just seem to hate Jews. Because I preach John 5, 6, 7, 8. <laughs> wait, wait till 9, 10, 11, 12. If you think, if you think Jesus is anti-Semitic through these verses, you should see what he's going to say next. And I asked him, I said, you know, what, what do you do with that? He says, well, if anti-Semitic means we hate the Judaism of first century because it's satanic, then, then we're anti-Semitic. He said, as a Jewish person, the Judaism of first century was not the Judaism of Abraham. Abraham looked toward Christ. Well, we have a misunderstanding in our culture to think that everyone who uses the name Jesus is a believer. Well, there are thousands of cults who would use that word. There are thousands of people who sit in the confines of buildings and call themselves Christians every single day who will reject the core issue of the atonement. They will not receive the idea that Paul and Jesus, very clearly the apostles teach that Christ satisfied God's wrath. He is a noun. He is our propitiation. So that at His death, God the Father then 
is fully and completely and forever satisfied to bring no more judgment against his people. And then we have this real misunderstanding, as they did in the first century, that God's people are those who are ethnic Israel. And Jesus says very clearly, you are not the sons of Abraham. You are the sons of your father, Satan. Now see, if we went around saying that to people today, it would be really bad because people would come against us because we were just being rude. And some people like to take the narrative and say, oh, see, Jesus said things like this, therefore I can say things like this. Jesus is God and knows the heart of all men. No one had to tell him what was in man. He knew Nicodemus before Nicodemus ever was created. And he knew Nicodemus could not see unless he was born again. And I believe Nicodemus, from a worldly standpoint, was a good Pharisee. I believe he was a kind man. I believe he was a man who loved to teach people the truth. But he was as blind as Caiaphas, who said, we've got to kill him. We've got to kill Jesus. And his murderous, Cain-like heart. So this narrative, as all of these theological things were taking place, all of this teaching was taking place, imagine walking the world and the earth with Jesus. Do you know I believe that the disciples belly ached more than they rejoiced in that? I believe there are many times where we get a little insight there. John especially, he'll say, you know, we were murmuring about who gave him food. Or we were murmuring about, why was he talking with that Samaritan woman? We dared not say anything because it's rude. You know, we don't, we don't call out our teacher like that. But, oh, we were talking about it in the locker room, <laughs> not on the field. We were talking about it in the break, not in the classroom. We were talking about it, you know, over there at the, at, at, at the fountain. But we weren't saying it out here in public during the ministry times. Oh, but we surely didn't understand. We see that very clearly. They didn't understand. They, they could not really see... And they still had all sorts of presuppositions, a lot of doctrinal things that they just assumed were right because they'd always been taught them for centuries. These people had been taught things from Scripture that were absolutely heinous and wrong. And one of them was that this man was blind because he was a sinner in the womb. That he'd done something gravely disastrous before he was born to cause his blindness. And if it wasn't him, then it must have been his mother. Maybe she worshipped a pagan idol. Maybe she didn't give her tithe the way she should have. Maybe she forgot and kept a better sack of flour for herself rather than donating it to the temple for sacrifice. See, some of us would say, well, that's just ridiculous. We don't have that type of mindset. Yes, we do. You know how many years that I sat under the bondage of this? Why are you robbing God? I'm robbing God? Oh my goodness, how am I robbing God? Because you're not tithed in a tenth of your income. That's demonic. You can't rob God. He owns it all. 2 Corinthians 9, you know is how we as the New Testament church, we give out of the abundance, we give as a desire of our heart, as the Lord has granted us the ability, and we are thankful. We do it with a cheerful heart, not because we're scared of God. Oh, you know, teetotalers, I love you guys. I'm one of you. Yeah? But we can't, we can't say that God prohibits the use of alcohol. For it is a symbol of joy and is a command to Timothy because of the constant nervousness and angst that he had that Paul tell, told him to drink wine. That it would calm his nerves, would calm his stomach. But if he had been drunk, of course he would have been in sin. So you see the cultural things that we're talking about? Or how about how people, how about how people speak? Or how they might um, like sports? Can we worship sports? Yes, just as much as we can worship buildings and cars and children and each other, our spouse. And yeah, we can see people, but is it a sin? Is it wicked? Is it evil? And see, some people will hear what I'm saying now. They'll say, oh, you're preaching a license to sin. What's sinful about anything I've said? There's a difference in what is wise and good for us in our conscience and what is sinful and evil before the Lord. There's a big difference. And the Jews of the first century were no different. Friends, I will tell you this, that many people who would hold to a high standard of morality 
and state to themselves that they know that they are right with God because of the continuation of how they are growing in their own righteousness are absolutely lost and blinded spiritually and they cannot believe. You know why? Because it's the exact thing that we've been learning over the last few months. People that trust in themselves while saying it is all of grace. Look what God has made me from grace. God's not going to judge us based on our performance. He is going to judge us in comparison to Christ's performance. And if we are in Christ, then His obedience gets credited to us and we are holy. If we're not in Christ, then we surely shall be found wanting in the comparison of Christ. And in that, beloved, in that, beloved, we hope, we hope, we hope that in Christ, not wish upon a star, but we hope in Christ. We trust in Christ. We do not trust in ourselves. So these people thought, well, this man who's been begging his entire life must be accursed from God because he's a sinner. He's a wicked and evil man. We, we established that last week, that it is a picture of depravity, that all people, there is no person who has ever lived in this world that is born under man who has ever had the ability or the freedom of the will to see and believe on Christ without a divine work of Christ. And I'm not talking about the, the doctrine of demons in the context of prevenient grace. And I know that's a very harsh dogmatic statement, but let me tell you something. God's grace is effectual. It always does the work that it does because God's grace is given through the power of the Spirit and the Spirit of God does not woo, as we've learned already, it drags. There is no wooing. I have a story, but I won't tell it today. I'll tell you after church. Just happened this week to a friend of mine. It's very <laughs> similar to that. We don't, we don't have the ability because we're dead in our trespasses and sins. There is this weird supernatural blindness that's over us that even the smartest of people can't see the simplest of logic. Brother Michael and I were talking about this before service. In John 9, it is such a simple Simple, simple argument that a four or five year old, if they can read, could understand the argument that these people are blind and they can't see. They can't see. But they say they can see, but they can't see. And they can't see what's simply before them, that Jesus is God in the flesh, come to save His people from their sins. And they just, it's a simple logic. But even in the simplest of things, without a divine work of salvation, of regeneration, we would not see it today, beloved. What does it do? It promotes the humility of grace. Grace is getting that which you cannot earn, which you cannot be worthy or found worthy to receive. And grace is the, is the will of God after the counsel of His own desire and His own will. God saves who He wishes, when He wishes, how He wishes, and then He reveals it fully through the written Word 100% in every text of Scripture, old and new, God reveals His sovereign grace and when we say we can't see it, it's because we are not born of God. You see that? But we have a love affair in America with the experience of salvation. People would rather confess the testimony of what they felt rather than who they know. Oh, that service, man, I just felt the Lord. You didn't feel the Lord if you didn't learn the Word. And if the glory of God through the pages of Scripture does not wash you over, then no amount of good music and anything else that I have practiced before will ever get you there. What's the point? These disciples were debating with Jesus. They're like, okay, here's the master teacher. I want to know, teacher, tell me. We've all, for years, this man's been sitting out here, and we've all had the same question. Is he the sinner or is his mama sinner? What causes blindness? And this is last week's sermon. The blindness was caused sovereignly by God in order that the glory of God might be revealed in it. And it was not for the blind man's sake. 
It was for the sake of Christ. See, that's a, that's a teaching that many people have a very hard problem with until they're born again and mature in a gospel teaching fellowship. Because they cannot imagine that the suffering of the world, that God has anything to do with it. Well, if he doesn't, then he's a weak God. Let's find another one. Matter of fact, I know some of you who could sculpt one a little bit better than that. He passed by and he saw this man blind from birth. He's already said previously that he is the light of the world. In the very instance of the Feast of Tabernacles where at the evening they would light all the torches and from a distance that Israel or the Jerusalem could be seen from a distance. A lit up city. Remember when we talked about that and I talked about my long travels across country, those nine trips that we drove from San Francisco to here and, 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 and just... Sometimes you're going two and three hundred miles with nothing at three in the morning. And then you see a glow on the horizon like, yes, something. I don't care if it's on fire, I'm stopping. I don't, you know, whatever. If it's a bonfire, I'm stopping. I don't care what it is, I'm stopping. I'm going to find something to do. I'm going to get out of this car and I'm going to walk for a minute. There's this hope. So this illumination of Jerusalem was this beacon that people could see for miles. And people would go, wow, they're worshiping that weird God over there. And sadly, they weren't worshiping the God of heaven. Judaism isn't close. It's not like, all right, plus Jesus needs to come. No, that doesn't work. Paul says anything that's added to Christ is anathema. The devil's work in deceiving the nations is granted to him by God and empowered by God to do so. We see it in the teaching of Paul to the Thessalonians, where he says that God will grant power for great and power and deception and signs and wonders to deceive the nations. We see 2 Corinthians 4 that the gospel is veiled, but it's only veiled to those who are unbelievers because the God of this world has blinded their eyes to keep them from seeing the glory of God. You see this judicial blindness. And God is evil if he takes this blindness away, having not first satisfied the judgment of that person's sin in the death of Christ. It is finished. This is a simple gospel. It runs throughout all the veins and capillaries and arteries of the scripture, and there is no escaping it, but you cannot see it except you're born again. This man was born blind. so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus said, as I've mentioned, he is the light of the world. He continues that there in verse 5. I am the light of the world. The person who comes to me, the person who sees me, will never walk in darkness. The person who approaches me and believes in me will never walk in darkness. Now some people say, well see, you just said that you can't believe. Absolutely, Jesus says in John 6 that no one can come, no one can believe unless the Father drags him and gives him to me. And, no, and all that the Father draw will come. They will believe and they will be raised up on the last day. You see that? This is an imperative. This is an absolute. This is not a possibility. This is a certainty. Jesus is a certain Savior. He has done the work of redemption. He has done the work of salvation. He has finished the atonement. This is not a lingering possibility. It is an absolute certainty that no one who has been given to Christ will perish in their sins. They will believe by the power of regeneration. And that is only given to those for whom Christ died, beloved. This is the gospel. It is good news. And we aren't here to discern if we are yet to be elect or not elect. We are here to discern, are we believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ this day who says He paid for the sins of His people? Without seeing, there is no believing. Believing is seeing. Seeing is believing. And we have this picture here. Jesus is walking in the world and he says there in verse 4, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. 
for night is coming when no one can work. Now, I explained that to you last week, and I know that seems odd. Are you just going to just give a summary of your sermon last week? Yes, and then we're going to just really punch it in the face because going forward, we need to have this foundation as we see where the Jews come in. Because Jesus heals this man from blindness, and then he's not in the narrative for a little while because then people start to see this man who was blind and now he sees, and then they start to take him to their spiritual heads, the Pharisees, and then the Pharisees begin to ask, how were you healed? Because we already see what? Jesus healed the man, the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And he walks in healed after 38 years an invalid. And the only thing they see is the towel under his arm. Not that he's walking. And they don't say, glory be to God, you're walking. Oh, let's worship. They say, who told you you could take up your towel? Who told you you could pick your towel? How dare you hold a sleeping bag on the Sabbath? How dare you walk over here and take a journey? You should, you should die. That was their mentality. What a wicked, evil man of debauchery. <laughs> Pick up his towel and walk to give glory to God for his legs. You see? And it makes us laugh. But this is the seriousness of depravity. This is the seriousness of depravity, and it's the seriousness and the gravity of sovereignty, as we talked about last week, if you don't remember. The severity of sovereignty is that it, 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 there is a judgment on humanity, but the, the grace of sovereignty is that there is salvation in Christ. And here, Jesus is saying we must do the works of Him who sent me while it is still day. Night is coming. This daylight is while Jesus is in the world in His earthly ministry. He is the light of the world. There have been no people as close physically to Jesus as, that, as, as they were in that time. Even the Jews into the dispersion. Peter rests on this reality that though you have not seen Christ, you love Him. And though you still do not see Him, you love Him and are filled with a joy that is inexpressible. Though you suffer. Why? Paul says it very plainly in Romans 8. For we are his children. We are heirs. As he would say in Colossians and Ephesians. We are joint heirs with Christ. We have all things in Christ. We are the beloved. We have been purchased through the blood of Christ. And Jesus is the light of the world. There is no closer relationship, listen to this, that the Jews had with Jesus except when He was there before, him, before them. Think about this. They lived in utter darkness and the light of the cosmos stood before them. There is no greater light. If they were going to see in their natural minds there is no one else in the world that could cause them to see. I've had people even say, well, you know, if Jesus and the apostles would have just used Isaiah, then the Jews would have seen. No, they wouldn't. As a matter of fact, Jesus does use Isaiah. And we see in Luke's gospel where Jesus reads the words of Isaiah and they try to kill him. At first they go, oh, it's the year of salvation, the year of jubilee, it's the year of forgiveness, it's the year of redemption, praise be to God. And he goes, but it ain't for you. It's not for you. They rejoiced at the blessedness and the graciousness of this man's teaching as he took the scroll, not even a real rabbi according to the tradition of men. And then he says, but just like God sealed the wombs, of His people, just like God refused to rain upon the crops of His people and they died in starvation, so shall you be barren and crippled. And they tried to push Him off the cliff. This is a continuation of this reality. 
Jesus asserts two things here in this text that are vital for the rest of the book. One is he is the sent one. Well, three things then. Two, he is doing, only doing, the works of the Father. And what's the third thing? He is the light of the world. He's the sent one. Here we see continually, over and over again, Jesus saying, I am from the Father. I come from heaven. I come from above. I have been sent to do the will of the one who sent me. And every time he talks with the Jews, they continue to assert that they are God's people, that they are God's representatives on earth, that they are the vicar, if you will. And then, lo and behold, Jesus says, no, it's me. I'm the living water. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the temple. Destroy it. I'll show you in three days what it looks like to be rebuilt. I'm the holy of holies. I'm the mercy seat. I'm where God meets man. You can't see. His very first miracle to teach his disciples that no one but them knew and his mother. He takes the water of ceremonial cleansing, the water of the image of preparation for righteousness, and he turns it into wine. And not just bottled box wine from the dollar store. He turns it into the best wine these people have ever tasted. And they are amazed. And who gets the credit? The bridegroom gets the credit. Well, he failed to plan to begin with. There's a theological teaching in the miracles of Jesus. Jesus did not do miracles just to say, ta-da, like David Copperfield. There's a piano, and now it's gone. And everybody's, oh, wow. There's my thumb, and it's coming off. Whoop, I fixed it. I mean, that's where most people looked at Jesus. Well, there's a miracle. There's another miracle. Let's see another miracle. Let's get some more. And you know what? This miracle man even makes bread. He's like a bread machine in a fish factory. Let's follow him over there to Capernaum and see if he can't do some more miracles. Hey, I bet if we placate to his power, he'll feel all excited. Well, they really love me. Let me give them some more fish and bread. How do you know that? Because Jesus says, when they said, oh, when did you get here? He goes, he rebukes them. Don't labor for the food that perishes, but for the bread that endures you eternal life. You know what he said? I don't care how hungry you are. I'm not feeding you anything else because I'm the true bread. You need to understand that what I did for you yesterday would, is not going to give you life because you're hungry this morning. And if you don't eat of my flesh, you're going to be hungry forever. And the only way you're going to have to have spiritual satisfaction is if you eat of me. What is he talking about? That my flesh and blood is spilled and crushed for you. If what I do is not for you, you die in your sins. The woman of Sychar had the same argument, didn't she? Why would you ask me, a woman, to give you water if you knew who it was who were asking you for a drink? And you knew what kind of water that I give you living water. Wells up to eternal life. Oh, <laughs> Eternal water? Give it to me. Why don't you go ask your husband to come here? Well, I don't have a husband. Nope, you've had five and you're shacking up. That's what he says. And that's why you're here at a weird place at a weird hour getting water because you don't want to be mocked by the women of the world. These self-righteous people who look at you and you're in sin. I mean, there's no doubt about it, but they make you feel bad. And you shouldn't be in sin, but Jesus doesn't go there, does he? No. She, comes, she starts to talk to him about spiritual things. Oh, you're a prophet. Ooh. Mr. Prophet. Are we worshiping correctly on Mount Gerizim? Are we worshiping the one true God? Are we worshiping rightly? And she closes that discourse with Messiah will tell me all things. Behold, I met a man who told me everything I've ever done. She argued spiritual things and argued religious things and argued theological things. And when the Holy Spirit opened her eyes, she trusted fully in Christ. And when he said he was Messiah, he was the Christ, she left everything and ran and told everybody. 
Embarrassed to be seen, now she runs into the town center. I don't care. Christ has set me free. What is my sin anymore that Christ has paid for it? Beloved. Jesus is the light of the world. He is doing the works of God. He has been sent by God, but the question is, what is the work of God? John 6, he already tells us, right? So you have to keep this stuff in mind so you can keep going. That's why I think you need to read this every week instead of just coming in here on Sunday and hearing small little pieces. If you're not reading it, you're not, you're not being fed very well this morning. And if I knew everybody read it on Saturday night, I could get into a lot more of the text. It's okay, I'm just picking at you. I'd still be just like this. So we come and see Jesus saying in John 6, what does He say? They say, what must we be doing to do the works of God? What does God require of us? What is it? And He says, this is the work of God, that you believe on the Son that He has sent. Sent. See, the divine nature of Jesus is an essential the virgin birth of Jesus is an essential. The vicarious atonement is essential. The substitutionary atonement is essential. The fact that Jesus was punished for the sins of His people is essential. This is an essential doctrine. That means that it cannot waver. We can't say, well, I just don't really see that. But I know Jesus is my Savior. But if you don't know that He saved you and how He saved you, you can't say that you believe in what He's done. And quite honestly, beloved, having faith doesn't make you born again. Being born again allows you to believe. And we've seen that from the very beginning. John 1, 2, then 3, we see it played out very clearly. And then 4, we see it in practice. 5, we see the antithesis where those would not believe. And then 6, we see the actual details of the high Christology, the theological systems of Jesus and His work, the intricacies of His personhood, that He was sent from God, that He is God, that He came to do the work of God, and the work that He came to do is to pay for the sins of His people. And so on and so forth. And now here we are having having understood fully that Jesus is better than Moses and Jacob and Abraham. And the light of the world is sitting in front of these spiritual leaders and they are confident in themselves and their own spirituality. Now see, some people say that. say, well, you don't want us to be confident? You don't want us to have faith? You don't want us to have assurance? Absolutely! But if our assurance is in ourselves, we have no assurance. Beloved, even if we're not tripping... We're stomping all over righteousness. We're kidding ourselves to say we don't have sin. All of you have sin in your life. This very moment as you hear the sound of my voice and hallelujah, so do I. And that's a joke to say hallelujah there. We will have sinfulness affecting our lives. But we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We've been called to put to death the flesh because Christ died and therefore we died to sin. But it is a constant thing. And so our hope is in the light of the world. Our hope is not in to take the light of our life and shine it around and look at ourselves in the mirror and look at all these other things going on and saying, well, you know, I know I have hope. I know I have confidence because look at what I've done. Look at what I can do. Look at what I believe even. We don't put faith in the exercise of our own faith. Because friends, how many times in your life, in the last year even, has your faith faltered? How many times in the last year have you sat there in the consciousness of your soul and thought to yourself, am I really a believer? Be honest. See, if one of them old line churches, we'd have a microphone up here in a mourner's bench, we'd have some confessions. But just yesterday, huh? Yeah. Because, I mean, we'd all have something to say, wouldn't we? And we tell ourselves, well, i just got to be stronger. i got to be better for Jesus. i got to do more so I can feel secure. We can feel secure because Christ secured us. That's the gospel. 
And we see it because God has made us alive to give us spiritual eyes. Friends, this is the hope. This is why we gather every single week so that we can be encouraged by this truth, so that we can see that the Holy Spirit, God, teaches us through the hearing of His Word because we belong to Him. And no matter how close Jesus is in proximity, unless we are born again, He is not our Savior. We are not His people. But we who are His people are born again. We will be born again. We will come to faith. We will believe. And how is that? We will, when we hear the gospel, the Spirit gives life. It's a simultaneous thing. God has chosen this weird natural means of transmitting the teaching of His Word through writing, through syntax. And then in that same time, as He wishes, John 3, the Spirit of God blows into the hearts and minds of His people and they believe and they see and they can see they're no longer blind. And that's the point of this. Jesus was sent to do the work of God and the work of God that Jesus was sent to do is to be the light of the world. To be the light of the world. To stand in the midst of spiritual depravity. And you notice, listen to this church, you notice that where Jesus did His ministry and in the heartbeat of the religious center of the world, Salvation is of the Jews, Jesus says in John 4. Jesus says that that's the darkness. And when Jesus dies and then ascends, He will no longer be present personally in His flesh with these people. And so in that reality, He says that it will be night for them. It will be night for them. It will be darkness for them. And though we as His people are sort of enveloped in the darkness, sometimes we feel like that there's no spiritual hope to be seen in the world around us. A new survey came. I don't even want to talk about this. A new, let's just say somebody wrote something. And just recently this week, and basically says that the church is in decline. That the church of Jesus Christ is diminishing daily and things are getting worse. And they're basing that on the number of butts in the seats. As the true church of Christ will never be in decline. Christ will lose none for whom He has died. He will raise us all up in the last day. The reason things are in a decline is because what they've been caught with is now boring. The reason people think to see or seem to think that there is the so-called church in decline, and, and, and by the way, the gathering of people doesn't necessarily make it the body of Christ. It just makes it a church, an institution. But the true assembly is a living organism of human beings who have been redeemed by Christ, not a bunch of people gathering around an institution. But the reason that we see people leaving so-called churches is because they no longer are interested in the entertainment. They're no longer interested in that which, I mean, do you watch, you ever watched a sci-fi movie from the 50s? The Godzillas of the 50s? You know, the old horror movies of the 30s? And even before? I used to love those as a child and I'd, look, and I'd be so scared I had to sleep with all the lights on. And now you look at them and I can do finger puppets scarier than that. My five-year-old could build something out of Legos that's more scientifically uh, you know, robust than some of the sci-fi movies of, of that era. And you're thinking, well, why were we ever scared? And now, because it's boring. We've got newer and better now. We've got CGI that you don't even have to have actors for. You just need a guy in a green suit that looks like a green Spider-Man with no eyes and he can stand there and move and then they can create an entire character he never says a word and we're like wow that's amazing and that's what the church the so-called church of America has done starting with Finney in the 19th century let's do this let's do that let's make something happen let's make God work get in this circle get in this circle God told me if you get in this circle he'll save you from hell the circle was too small, so they made it bigger. 
And it was still, still too small, so they made it even more bigger. And then Finney's just like, well, just come on up front. If you just come on up front. He's like, oh, there's not enough front. Just stay in your seats. Just raise your hand. Just look at me. Just check the box. Just take the bag. Were you sincere? Did you mean it? You see? And there's no gospel anymore. There's no proclamation of what God has done and finished. There's no light in the world anymore in that aspect. So the church is not in decline, beloved. Because God will preach the gospel so that His sheep will hear it. And the heralds of peace will be called fools in the face of our culture. Now that's a, that's a fallacy in itself. Well, you know, you're persecuted. Everybody who's persecuted says it's because they're following God. I mean, the Mongols said they were persecuted because they were following God. The Catholics said they were persecuted because they were following God. You know when they were slaying people that didn't convert the crusades on both sides of the coin? The cults say that they're, doing, they're being persecuted because they're following God. But friends, we don't have to say that if we preach the gospel, people hate the message. And in doing so, they wipe the messenger off the face of the windshield. Jesus is the light of the world because that's what God the Father sent Him to be. And what does that mean for you? That's where we are. What it means, what Jesus did physically to this man born blind is a picture, is a shadow, is a type to point to what He was doing salvifically for His people. That's it. And so what did He do? He declares... He didn't, he didn't ask this man if he wanted to be saved. They, this man didn't even know they were talking about him. He walks over to this man, and he's standing there in earshot, and Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And the works that I do while I still at night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now this doesn't mean that after Jesus ascended, he's no longer the light of the world. But he's talking specifically about his ministry before the cross. That he is in the closest proximity, fleshly, that he'll ever be with these people. But he's in the world, and this is what I've been sent to do by the Father. And it is to find my people and show them how they can see by looking at me. And you think this is exciting. Wait till next week. So Jesus, having said these things, verse 6. This is where we'll be for 6 and 7 for the rest of our time. He spit on the ground. <laughs> in most communities across the colonies, there are still laws on the books that prohibit spitting on the sidewalk or the ground. Why? Because it's unsanitary, right? I mean, I don't even know if it's here today, but there's a lot of old laws that have been enacted here from you know, about the 1800s and early 1900s. And there's some weird stuff. And they can't really enforce those laws anymore. Just, for example, like adultery is a crime in Claxton. You can go to jail for it uh, and all sorts of things are crimes. But they don't really enforce it. But spitting on the ground is a crime in some places, and they don't enforce that anymore. Why would they enforce it? But, I mean, you imagine the advent of tobacco or in a, in a, in a, in a, in a not so primitive, but in an early colonization. I mean, spittle transfers and transmits what? Disease. And not just that, even the proper society. I don't want to step in spit. I don't want to step in all that stuff. I mean, it's just sort of gross. I don't know of any culture where spitting on somebody or spitting in general is like, man, that's such a classy guy. It's always good when you're going into a restaurant and you're ready to eat and you're hungry and the guy coming out of the restaurant decides he's going to spit his whole wad of tobacco at your feet. You know, and you're like, well, I'm not eating. You've seen it. Now, people have tried to come up with all sorts of interesting theories about why Jesus spit. Do you even know, remember when we talked about the, the, the breaking of the Sabbath, the silly laws of the Sabbath that the, Jew, that the Jews, the Sanhedrin and all, came up with, the Mishnah and other areas of, of writing. It was against the law to spit as a Jew in the dirt on the Sabbath because it was considered work. Because it was considered fallowing the soil working the soil. It would make mud, so therefore it would work the soil. The saliva would soak into the soil, the soil would become mud, and that was a work. It was a crime, according to Jewish law. So in like manner, it was also 
considered bodily fluids were considered taboo. You didn't touch them. You didn't touch people who had fluids. If you were like a, what do you call it, a leper, you couldn't even be in the same vicinity as normal society. You had to walk around. If you had to come near, you rang a bell and you yelled, unclean. I mean, for some of us germaphobes, that'd probably be pretty cool. I'm nasty. Don't get too close. And like, we weren't getting close anyway. Just okay. Shake my bottle of sanitizer. How you doing? So people have su supposed, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe this tradition. Oh, maybe it's this. And this is actually appeals to me in some way because I love connection. Some people say, you know, just as God created man out of the soil, now Jesus is creating sight out of the mud. And I'm like, okay. Makes sense. But how about the immutability of God and the congruency of Scripture is that what he would do in these other parts of Scripture, especially John's Gospel, and the intention and the motive that Jesus had, maybe it's some the same? So Jesus would tell the man at the pool of Bethesda to get up and take his mat and go show himself to the chief priest. Why not just go home and tell his family, look, I'm healed? Because he wanted to confront the idolatry and the unbelief of the spiritual leaders of that day. For a lack of a better way of putting it, it was the purpose of God and his sovereignty to rub into the faces the wickedness of their religion so that they would be exposed for exactly who they were. Now that doesn't give us the license to do it because Jesus is God. He did it. The, the, the apostles did not. And then Jesus tells us to love our enemies and not defend ourselves and to be quiet. And not, not debate and argue and become divisive. And I've had somebody even tell me this morning, oh, you're always talking about divisiveness. You're just divisive. You just think we're divisive because we're speaking the truth. I'm like, you know what? Block. Don't, don't send me a message like that on Sunday, on Sunday morning. And some of you who are wise say, don't read those things on Sunday morning. Can't get away from them. But Jesus spit, I think, because it was a violation of their code of ethics, their code of conduct. It was a violation to spit. It was a violation to touch spit, much less put it in somebody's face. Thank God he was blind. Can you imagine Jesus trying to, somebody trying to heal you like that? I'm like, whoa, 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 I'll just stay an invalid. You walk because you don't want to get spit on you. It's gross. And I think that this is the nature of why Jesus did this. This was his intention to just do things in a sort of way. You know, I've heard people argue, well, you know, Jesus' spit had power. Mm, the power to be gross. Well, if we could just get Jesus' blood, if we had a drop. Imagine, I've heard this before. Imagine if we had one drop of Jesus' blood in a vial. I said, we'd dip it in gold and we'd take it to the Vatican. What would you do? You'd just have a drop of blood. The power of God does the healing, not the spit. Not the, not the, the, the fountain that he went to, to, to wash in. None of those things did healing. It was God who did healing. Christ who did healing. And he did it so that he could show the principle of life eternal as the light of the world to a man that was born blind that had not sinned in order to cause his blindness. He was a sinner. So Jesus spit in the ground and he made mud with the saliva and he anointed the man's mud, eyes, man's mud, man's mud with eyes. That's a weird picture. He anointed the man's eyes with mud. And then he said to him, and, this, and John clarifies this because it's important, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went, and he washed, and he came back seeing. Now, there's a hermeneutic. What is that? It's how you interpret text that people love to lay over this and impart things that are not there. Oh, this is good stuff. If you don't go, you don't get your healing. See? Nah, you don't get your healing whether you go or not. The reason the man went is because Christ sent. And the reason Christ sent is because he proved he was the sent one by giving blind, sight to the blind. And the reason he gave sight to the blind is to prove that he was the sent one and that he was going to help us see. And not just help us see, 
make us see, cause us to see, create in us the ability to see, make us new that we could see. And there's another healing of a blind man where Jesus heals him, he touches him, remember? And he looks and he says, what do you see? He asks him, what do you see? I see people that look like trees. And he touches him again and he was healed. The context there rules. Do you know context when interpreting scripture overcomes the meaning of words? Context drives the meaning. Syntax is determined by context. If you interpret Scripture by going to the Word and looking at what the Word means and getting all the different definitions, oh, that's what this means. It's not, it's not okay. It's bad. It's a poor hermeneutic. It's a poor... Read the words. God does what is simple through the Scripture so that we can read the words and see very clearly what He's saying. Jesus sent this man to the pool called Sent because He is the one that was sent. And the washing off that mud... He went to the place called scent and he washed off the mud and he could see. So in a, in a sense, the pool itself is a picture of Christ. And I could give you the history. Oh my goodness, I could give you the history of that pool and where it did and what it had use for in the temple and all these different things and, 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 and start making you know, connections and it'd be like, wow, but in simple terms, this is what Jesus is showing us. Christ was sent to do the work of God and He was sent to be the light of the world to bring His people to sight because they are born blind. See how short this sermon could have been? It's just that easy. But we have to take it in the whole. Jesus is the light of the world. He came to seek and save the lost. Jesus' only work is to bring His people to salvation and cause them to see and believe. That's His only work. That's His only work. That's what He was sent to do. And look what happens in the next few verses. Preparation for next week. And the neighbors, those around, and those who had seen him before as a beggar, were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. And others says, no, but it looks like him. That's what that means there. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how will your eyes open? How? And then he says, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he says, I do not know. You know why the man didn't know? Because he couldn't ever see Jesus in the flesh. The light of the world was in the flesh and there was a time coming when night would come. He would leave the world, but he would send the paraclete. He would send the spirit, the helper. And so Jesus, the Son, God the Son, would go and God the Spirit, same essence and authority and omnipotence and omnipresence, is here and doing the work of God as well as Jesus was doing the work of God. And he's still causing people to see as we continue to do the work that God's called us to. Have the gospel in your heart and mind. If you need clarification, I can show you. If you don't know how much to say, just get a start. Pray that God would, because you see, would help you to be ever more diligent to know and to share the gospel of grace. So that God would call His sheep home. As we'll see in chapter 10. They will hear His voice. It's okay if 25 people a day reject your message. Or tell you to not speak of that again. You know what we're not called to do? Stand on a table and preach it. That's never been called of a man. Woman or child. When we share the gospel and someone shuts the door in our face. We dust off the, sh the, the, the dirt from our sandals and we move on. 
because they have heard with their physical ears and the rest is up to God. No amount of begging, pleading, arguing, debating, apologetics, or, or anything else will cause someone to see. It is only Christ who is the only light who overcomes the darkness. The darkness will not overcome him. Beloved, you see, in spite of yourself, we are born again because of the work of God the Son who was sent by the Father. Trust in that for yourself. Trust in that for your children. Trust in that for your family. Trust in that. God, the only hope I have, that's how we pray for our loved ones and for our enemies. The only hope I have that you will save them is that you open their eyes and cause them to believe that Christ has died for them. Pray that. Rest in the sovereignty of God and rejoice when we see the outcome of these things. Let's pray. We love you, Father, for all that you are and all that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, that you have sent your Son to be the light of the world. And, Lord, that there is no possible way that the darkness will overcome. But in all things, your people will believe you will not hide your face from us. Grow us in our understanding of this truth. And, Father, though many of us are tired and fatigued for so many reasons, Lord, help us to have a zeal and a life inside of us that's not puffed up and and out of control, but Father, solidified in the teaching of the Scripture, grounded in the gospel of grace. Lord, give us a resolve that is unshakable and that we continually hope in Christ. Not ourself, not our, hope, not our own ability, not even our own faith, but Lord, in your faithfulness to save your people for the sake of your glory that we see perfectly through the Scripture in the face of Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen.